Uh, yes, why don't you just put up whatever the first image you got and uh, should be up in a okay. moment. That's lovely. That's beautiful. Um, so as you might guess, uh, this week we're going to speak about the Virgin Mary there on the right and the angel Gabriel over there on the left. And uh, we're going to talk about the Annunciation because uh, next week, I won't be able to be with you next Tuesday, but next week on the 25th, we celebrate this feast. And it's a, a feast that is celebrated by everybody, uh, Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians, the Orthodox, everybody celebrates this feast because it falls exactly nine months before Christmas. So if you want to start looking forward to Christmas, uh, next week will be nine months exactly to the day. Uh, of course, because this is where the incarnation begins. Um, this is, you see, this is sort of symbolized in the middle where there's a, a lily to, to sort of uh, signify Mary's being a virgin and purity. But the angel gives the blessing, uh, you know, just as the priest does with his fingers like that. And Mary's hand is bent down uh, in a certain sense, saying yes, which is exactly what we hear in the gospel. And I'm going to read just a little portion of that because it's one of the loveliest passages in St. Luke. Um, and it comes, of course, uh, right at the very beginning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him, him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. So this is really the incarnation, the feast of the incarnation. It's not just Christmas in March, although for people back up north <laughs> and in the East Coast, they, when it gets to be March, uh, for any of you who have friends up there, um, they, they, they long for it to be something else than winter. Uh, but this is the beginning of the plan of salvation. One of the, one of the verses that's used in um, the prayers of the hours say that this is the beginning of the new promise of salvation. Obviously, God had been talking for many, many years through the prophets, and in a way, uh, this is the beginning of a new phase, a new chapter in God's actions for the human race, where God is not going to just send another prophet. He will send John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus, but God will come as a human being. And of course, this is what distinguishes the Christian faith from all the other world religious traditions. They all believe in God in some way, shape, or form. But none of them uh, ever really come to be uh, of the mind that God becomes human, takes up time and space, is born of a woman, lives, dies, is buried, and is raised to new life. Uh, there is really, there are some, some resemblances to that in some religious traditions, but, you know, God in, 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 in the material world, God in humanity, never really quite come together as it happens in Christianity. Uh, 
in a way, uh, this is also a reminder uh, that uh, we're going to start springtime uh, on the 21st of March. And this feast falls right at the beginning of the spring equinox. And so it's a promise of, of new life. Even here in the desert, though we're not having a super bloom this year, uh, we are seeing some very small signs of this. The brittle bushes is blooming. The citrus trees are coming into blossom. You can go to the next one, Patrick. That's fine. Go ahead to the next one. Um, this is a view of the same thing happening, but from the painter James Tissot, uh, he was painting in the late 1880s and 90s, and he even went over and lived in Palestine for a couple of years to try to absorb the culture. And um, here he has uh, the angel almost portrayed as one of the cherubim or seraphim with the many wings and, and just the radiant face. And there is Mary, who is a very young girl, only 12 or 13 years old. Um, and she is garbed as, as Tiso saw Bedouin women garbed, you know, in lots of cotton, very light cotton because of the climate. And uh, she is in, with her hand extended, uh, both of them. She is saying, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to God's word. So this is a, this is also a model for us of, of, of how we should orient ourselves toward God. Uh, God has to use us. He could use angels. Uh, they do bring messages. Um, God could also, I suppose, cause all kinds of natural disasters to happen. But for example, even when we think of Ukraine today, uh, what's going to solve the, the mess that's there are human beings finally saying enough, enough, enough killing, enough destruction, um, we have to end this. And uh, it's always human beings who feed the hungry, who clothe those who are in need of, of, of clothing and who provide shelter and other kinds of care. How about the next one, Patrick? The feast um, itself, this is a wonderful uh, version of it by Fra Angelico. And I was once privileged to be in, uh, in, in Venice where this is uh, in a monastery that he painted it in, uh, the Dominicans monastery there. And you walk up the stairs and literally almost walk into this painting. It's fairly large. The figures are almost uh, life-size. But this is the Middle Ages, and you see a beautiful garden in the background. You see the beautiful spring flowers, like they come out here. You know, we're getting the daisy dandelions and some of the other little ones, the popcorn, and even a little bit of verbena now. And as I said, the brittle bush. Um, th this is a kind of a springtime. This is a, 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 a promise of things to come. And again, Mary is the young girl with her hands here crossed on her on her chest saying, uh, I don't really understand all of this. I don't have a husband yet, uh, but, this, but this is what God is saying to me through you. You're, you're God's messenger. I'm not afraid of you. You greeted me as the one who is full of grace. That's the Ave Maria. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Um, uh, and so Mary says yes. And uh, some of the church writers say that when Mary said yes, she said it for herself but she said it for all of us who would come after her, that uh, when God comes to us and when God presents himself to us and when God offers us a way of being part of the plan uh, for, the, for peace and goodness and joy in the world, we have to say yes. We can't say anything else but yes. How about the next one there, uh, Patrick? I've got quite a few here today. This is a modern one. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, Mar Marashko, uh, I think Marie Marashko, in fact, um, where the angel comes through a curtain, carrying again the symbol of the lily, which represents uh, Mary being a virgin. Uh, Mary is doodling away on a painting there. Um, and uh, without even looking at the angel, she's got her hand up to her face saying, what am I hearing? What is happening here? Uh, this, this is not something I had planned on. That's another thing that the, that the gospel reading sort of presents to us. 
uh, God is a surprise always. Uh, God, God doesn't just follow our plans. God follows God's plans. And um, you can see that in a certain sense, this is uh, not just a surprise to her, but also a kind of a wondering and a kind of confusion and maybe even a certain anxiety. Um, how is this going to happen? Um, I was just being prepared, you know, to grow up. Um, I, I, I don't even have somebody that's in my life that I'm engaged to. And yet here you are telling me, not only am I going to have a child, but this child is going to be a son. And he is going to be, because of his name, Yeshua, or Jesus, he's going to be the savior of all peoples, not just us Jews, but of everybody in the world. That is a very large message. So here you see a couple of others. This is a modern icon, like the first one we saw from Ukraine. Once again, the symbol of the, the lily. Uh, here, Mary is, is actually, she's got in her hand a bowl of, of um, uh, uh, she, she's weaving and, and spinning and, and knitting. She's got thread there in her hand. And the story was, is that she was putting together part of what would be the, the veil that hung in the temple. Um, and, and the uh, church fathers, church writers also say that in a certain sense, she would be knitting together uh, in her womb, this baby who would become the savior of the world. And the, the angel is, is not sort of saying, stay away from me with the hand up like that, but he's giving the greeting that messengers or heralds uh, gave in the ancient world. You see, he also has, you see the, little bands sticking out from the back. That's uh, the, the, the sort of little band around his head is, is the uh, uh, uniform of messengers or heralds in the ancient world. Uh, they wore this red band around their head with the, the ends coming down so that everybody they encountered on the road would know they have a message, they have to get through. Uh, the information is very important make a little way for them. Well, here's, here's information that is being brought to just one person here, but as the gospel reading says, it is information for the rest of the world. This is the famous uh, English painter Dante Rossetti. Uh, his sister, Christina Rossetti, wrote the beautiful words uh, to uh, uh, one of the Christmas carols that we sing about the dead of winter and stone and, and the cold lay, lay like a stone. Um, once again, the lily. Here too, there is also a bird, the Holy Spirit. You'll see this in a couple of the other images uh, where he says, she says to the angel, how's this going to happen? And the angel says, look, um, believe me, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And usually the representation or the symbol of the spirit is the white bird, the, the white dove. And here she is, she's in her room, she's on her, on her bed. Uh, she's almost recoiling in a way because again, this is a big surprise to her. This is disarming information. She doesn't know quite what to make of it, but she goes back onto her faith and her faith says, well, look, if God sends a messenger to you, if God tells you in a dream, if God tells you from reading something in the scriptures, if God tells you in a conversation you have with somebody else, uh, something, uh, then what you need to do is listen. It's sort of like the meditations we have every day in Lent that have been made by people in our parish. Uh, you know, Jesus says, listen to those who have ears, let them listen. What do we hear from God? Uh, this is Leonardo. Uh, and this is, of course, in the Italian Renaissance. So we have the gorgeous landscape in the background. Uh, we have the beautiful spring flowers in the foreground. Uh, we have Mary there. Uh, an elegant Italian Renaissance lady, and the even the angel looks like a Renaissance Italian uh, member of the court um, with the wings, but also the, the gorgeous uh, uh, robes. And uh, then the, here again, the blessing, um, hail, full of grace, hail, you who really are the one that I should be, you know, honoring, but I'm sent to you with a message. And in the other hand, the angel Gabriel has, uh, again, the lily symbolizing that he is coming to bring to someone who is very young and who is not even yet married, a message 
uh, that will change everything for her, but also change everything for the world. And uh, again, this is, this is that wonderful thing that happens when an artist puts it in his own time. So here we have a painting from, I believe, uh, this is from uh, Guatemala or El Salvador. And so the artist here has not tried to take us back in time, but we have here a young girl in a beautiful red dress. And she even has the teapot and a, and a cup next to her. And uh, the angel has, you know, almost a, a, looks like a, an action hero, right? There's sort of a suggestion of his, of his wings. And, and he's saying to her, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Um, there are roses all around. Mary is the mystical rose uh, as we sing at Christmas time. Uh, the angel has all kinds of wonderful designs on, 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 on his clothes, uh, but they all suggest nature, that this is springtime, that this is about life, because in fact, yes, he's telling her, um, life is going to take uh, form and shape inside of you. Uh, a child is going to be born who is going to bring uh, God to the world. And you see between the two of them, the white outline of the dove, uh, right between the two of them. Uh, Gabriel has his hand, first one hand as a, as a greeting or a blessing, and the other hand, here's the information. Oh, and here, by the way, is the spirit. Here, I am bringing you the, not only the news, but I am bringing the spirit of God to you, and the spirit of God will make all of this happen. Uh, and down below, you see there's even a book that she was reading. And there's also, I think that's a, a cat. Yes, I believe it's a cat. So Mary is a cat lover, right? Or is it a joke? No, it's a cat. It's a cat. Yeah. How about another one there, Patrick? We've got plenty more to take it's a look a at. It's a cat. Parrot. Yeah. And here's a, an, Asian, uh, an Asian one. This is uh, a Japanese one. So the angel here uh, is bringing not a rose, not a lily, but a, a, some kind of a beautiful flower. I don't really know what kind of flower that is. It almost looks like a magnolia or something. And uh, here, this is in the, uh, in, the, in the culture, in the vision of people of Asia. And Mary even has the pomegranate on her uh, table before her. And uh, she is uh, extending to the angel a hand that says, yes, whatever you're telling me, I'm listening to it. I'm going to try to abide by it. I'm, I'm going to try to put it into effect as best I can. Let it happen to me according to God's will. This is it. Whoops, whoop, whoop, whoop. Patrick, <laughs> Went too slow far. down. I'm, uh, I'm getting back. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're going to go there from we the go. one here. Here's an Indian one. Um, and so here you see the oil lamp is lit to the left. You see the bowl of rice. You see the prayer book or the scriptures, uh, you even see a little incense there. And Mary now is a young Indian girl, you know, with uh, even the, the mark on her forehead. And the angel again uh, is bringing her information. Now here, it looks like the angel is even bringing her tea and maybe something to eat. So I think that's kind of an interesting little twist on the story. It doesn't say this in the gospel, but you know, messengers sometimes not only have news to bring, they bring things to people. Um, and uh, once again, this is an example of taking something from the past and not just leaving it in the past, but bringing it into a present, uh, a present that would be familiar to people uh, from this huge Indian uh, uh, continent, yep, subcontinent. And here we are, Carlo Crivelli. We're back in the Renaissance. You've seen this one before. There are so many details in this, it would take a half an hour just to talk about this. Um, but, you know, down below, not only is there the angel Gabriel with a kind of a very elegant helmet on his head, but there's a local bishop. Well, there shouldn't be bishops around at this point in time. Uh, they don't come till much, much later on. But if I recall, um, this was painted for a particular city in Italy. And this uh, bishop was a martyr and the patron saint of it. And he's holding in his hands the cathedral church that would eventually be built. So time is being completely, you know, twisted around here. 
you're having something happen way ahead of the time, um, like uh, a Christian bishop show up to present uh, the church that will be built long after he's dead in the town where he died confessing the faith, all right? So that's a lot to, to process. Uh, but you still see that here we have the basic ingredients, the, the, the winged messenger, the angel, uh, who has also a lily in his, hand, in his hand, the Virgin Mary, who is there at prayer in her room, um, various objects up on her shelf, and coming right through a little window, coming right through the building, of course, is the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that beam of light. Uh, the spirit, of course, is life, but the spirit, of course, is also light coming right out of the heavens. And that reminds us again that what's happening here is that heaven and earth are not only just confronting one another, coming very close, but heaven and earth, in fact, are penetrating one another. Uh, heaven is now not going to be just God's reign or God's domain. It's going to become part of the, the very... Uh, world we live in. This is a very old one, probably one of the oldest images of the Annunciation. It comes, I believe, from the uh, late 200s or early 300s in a church in Rome. This is a mosaic. And of course, what we see here is Mary on the throne. And she's got a whole bunch of other angels around her. So it's like Gabriel brought his, his bros. <laughs> he brought his posse along with him. And uh, the Holy Spirit is coming up, down onto Mary. Mary is dressed as a elegant uh, Roman woman of the first or the second or the third century with beautiful headdress of pearls in her hair. Um, and the angel is described, uh, the angel here is, is, is kind of like an, an emotion picture. Coming down from heaven at the top, the spirit coming down too, and then present before her, you know, and indicating with his hand, you're the one who is uh, chosen by God to do this. And here's the message. This is what's going to happen. I also want to point out that all these guys are wearing the, the white robe that was the standard uh, vesture of uh, people in positions of power. And that's where our alb that we wear at church come from, comes from. Michael? This, yes, ma'am. Go back to two pictures. Uh, 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 it looks the who is the art that one? Who is the artist on that? Carlo Crivelli. Uh, and we looked at other works of his because that looks yes. so similar to something else that we've seen. Oh yes, we've seen other works of his. I mean, and okay. And interestingly, down at the at the bottom, it says Libertas Ecclesiastica. It means. Um, ecclesiastical or church freedom. And uh, <laughs> I almost take that as a joke because sometimes the church is known for having so many rules and so many do's and do, not, do nots that the idea of the church being a place of freedom almost seems to be um, either sarcasm or a joke. But the artist here, in fact, is quite serious about the fact that coming to earth uh, God is not bringing us bondage or slavery or captivity, but freedom and peace and joy. And then, you know, the upper part of this, I didn't even say a word about it, but, you know, we have here, you know, this fantastic building that you can see the in entire insides of, and there's a peacock sitting up there, and there's a beautiful embroidered uh, or damask uh, hanging and the plants up there. And then we have all these people in the background. Uh, you know, th this is really a fantastic scene. And I, I have to say that I, I have to go research and find out all that's happening. But I think the general idea here is to locate the Annunciation in everyday life and say, okay, um, in this town of Nazareth where Mary lived, okay, uh, life was going on for everybody. This was an ordinary weekday. People were doing their laundry. People were baking, taking care I just, of children. I, I'm you getting know. the impression that he used the same stage set. Yep. Because yep. what I'm remembering from the other one, and my memory's not that great, yep. but it, it was the same, almost the same staging. Yep. With and not only, not only he, but other Renaissance painters did the same kind of thing. 
when we ah. look at it now, when we look at it now, the thing that strikes us is that, oh my goodness, look at the beautiful architecture, look at all those arches, look at all of that uh, adornment, look at the beautiful coffered ceiling up at the top. Yeah, yeah. But the point is not so much to knock you over with all of that, you know, gorgeous design and uh, the wealth that must have been necessary to put up that Renaissance building. I think the real point is that this is happening in everyday life. Now, had Crivelli uh, maybe thought a little bit more carefully about this, um, he would have realized that in fact, Mary could never have lived in a house as elegant like this. You know, by this time in her life, her parents were dead. She was an orphan. She was being cared for by somebody else. And so the other pictures that we have, which show a much more modest, much more humble kind of location, they're, they're more accurate. But, but obviously here, you know, since this is being painted for the altar in a cathedral church, well, I suppose then Crivelli wanted to, to show the elegance uh, you know, if you will, that 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 God is also responsible for. God creates beauty. Uh, God's the one who creates the wealth. You know, it's we that misuse it. You know. Yeah. I, I actually found Thank the you. I'm iron sorry bars. But... Yes, but I, I, I found the iron bars on the window on the ground floor to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what you would expect to see. In your, that's what you would expect to see to guard against thieves. Right. So. That's right. And we've had some vandalism here in Borrego, and I and I suspect people are beginning to wonder. Oh my God, are we going to have to put up bars on the windows? This one here is by a guy named Thomas Collier. This is a modern picture. I love this one because my goodness, on the left, Mary looks like a schoolgirl, right? Um, Reading from our prayer book reading from her prayer book there's the lilies and uh the angel you know looks like a, a pretty good looking nice young guy except he's got wings coming out the back <laughs> and this is smack in the middle of suburbia right like she's standing on the doormat going into her house and you can see right around by the angel the next block with the suburban houses and so once again this was made for a church um I believe in Fort Worth, Texas. And I suspect that when the artists brought this in and they placed it in the chapel there in the church, it was the Our Lady's Chapel. Some people went, oh my goodness, this is not what we expected. We wanted something like Crivelli. We wanted some elegant scene in a palace. But here the artist says, no, no, this takes place in everyday life. She was a very young woman you know, probably the age of schoolgirls. Now here's the dreamy poetic version of this. This is by a British painter named George Hitchcock who worked earlier in the 20th century, all right? So this is probably from the, the 19s or the 1920s. And now he's, he's sort of chosen to make Mary look like a medieval lass. So she has the headdress on and the veil and she's not in her house praying. And she's not knitting, but she's strolling in this gorgeous garden. And look what's just popped up in the garden. Lily's galore. I mean, is this Easter Sunday or what? And then you see behind her, because this, of course, is England. You see behind her a wonderful field of wheat uh, that's been planted and that's ripening for harvest. And you see a beautiful hedgerow behind her. Uh, and... and uh, when I think of this, when I see this, I remember that five or six years ago when our daughter got married, uh, Jeannie took our garden, our vegetable garden, and turned it into a flower garden. And I can't remember what kind of uh, uh, flowers she painted, uh, painted, she grew, but she grew hundreds and hundreds of flowers for the wedding. And then finally, the week of the wedding, in two different trips, we cut all of these, uh, the local nursery guy gave us the, the powder to put into the water to preserve them. And two or three different cars took them all the way from our house up to Maine, where her wedding was going to be. Oh, but they wow. were planted in these little neat rows. Uh, I'll ask her what kind of flowers they were. Zinnias, zinnias. <laughs> she heard me. She said zinnias. So, okay, so this is another from 1914, another British painter. Uh, this is, you know, again, high drama. 
very high drama here, right? The angel looks like he's just flown in. He's got the lilies. He's greeting her. She's like, what is happening to me? And you see, she's also been been uh, knitting. You, you see the, the, the ball of uh, yarn down below there. And she's outside. She's not inside. She, her prayer desk is there. But, you know, she's been out on the patio in the back. And uh, guess who comes to visit her through the rose garden? <laughs> you can see the roses uh, into her backyard. Uh, but a messenger of God, not what she was expecting. This is an even more radical view, which is called by Raphael Sawyer, a contemporary American painter who's just died a few years ago, the Annunciation. What he chose to do is to, is to put in a scene where there is important information being given from one person to another. And we're not told what this information is. Uh, it isn't necessarily even religious, uh, but it's happening in the bathroom of an apartment I'm, or a house. Uh, and we see that there's laundry hanging up over on the right there, you know, draped over a, a, a maybe the, the shower door or something like that. And uh, somebody, the, 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 the angel here is a woman uh, who's got a towel in her hands. And then there's the one who is getting the message, who's got one foot on top of the other, her hands in her pockets. And obviously it's a message, uh, it's information that's made her, you know, stop and, and completely, you know, concentrate. It, it can't say it's good me a message or it's bad message, but it's obviously a, an important piece of information. And so I, I put this in because I think that sometimes an artist can also, you know, take some liberty and say that there's something in this scene in the scripture that is also part of everyday life. All of us, I think at one time or another, either have had through a phone call or a visit, um, important information, maybe very good information, maybe very sad information and shocking information. I think it, that's happened to all of us. But I do remember years ago, over seven years ago, in an Albertsons down in Poway, when I hear over the uh, the loudspeaker, you know, uh, Mr. Plekon, come up to the to the front um, because your wife wants to tell you that you now have a grandson. I was back in the meet <laughs> <laughs> so I thought to myself, I knew he was going to be born any day, but that was the. I, I was certainly surprised to hear it come over the loudspeaker in an album. <laughs> Okay, this is this is a very famous painting, and it has some resemblances to the Renaissance ones. Um, it is a little bit older. It's 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 from from uh, uh, France. Uh, Marod. This is part of the Marod altarpiece. We don't know the artist's name. He's called the Master of the Marod altarpiece. Over on the left are the husband and wife who donated this. They're the donors, so they are depicted. Um, they're coming to visit Mary and the angel. Uh, there's even a guy back by the, the gate into the, to the garden, but they're kneeling in the garden. So they're, they're in a certain sense, uh, bringing themselves to this great event. The angel's there. Uh, what I love about this is that you have this beautiful indoor uh, view, which you find in the Flemish and Dutch and French painters. Uh, later on, Mary seems to be absorbed in her prayer book, right? She also has the Bible there on, on, on the table. The table is sort of tilted toward us. And of course, there's a lily, but it's not in the angel's hand this time. It's, it's in a vase there on the table and a candle, which has just been snuffed out. And there's symbolism in that too. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, her life has now changed. Part of her life that uh, she thought was going to turn out in a certain way is now completely over and changed. She is going to be a mother. Uh, and, and of course, we know what happens with the rest of her life. Uh, she's going to follow her son around and then the unthinkable, watch her son uh, die on the cross. Uh, the angel here has been put into a beautiful blue robe with a beautiful blue sash around the waist. Um, we are not looking at Palestinians from the first century. We are looking at Europeans, um, you know, from the late 1500s. 
Um, there, there is also over in the right hand. Uh, I'm not seeing it because, of course, your picture, your pictures are there. But that's Joseph in his workshop because Joseph is is going to be engaged, or uh, perhaps is already engaged to her, but they haven't been married. And um, in a certain sense, Joseph will be drawn into this. And if you remember the Gospels, Joseph will have his own enunciation. Um, he will be troubled to see that his fiance is pregnant, even though they're not living together, even though the marriage has not been completed or consummated. Um, and an angel will come to Joseph and say, Joseph, don't be afraid. Don't be upset. Uh, all of this is happening according to God's plan. Uh, don't, don't call off the engagement. Don't expose her to the charge of fornication. Nope, just go along with this. Do your part in this and everything will work out fine. And of course, what happens after that is they go to Bethlehem and guess what? There's the birth of their son. And later an angel will come to Joseph again and say, you have to take the child and his mother and take them out of here, get out of Bethlehem and to Egypt because Herod wants to kill the child. And of course, we know Herod then will declare that all the young boys have to be slaughtered. Uh, have we come to the end, Patrick? I don't know if there are any more. I had quite a few today. I like the perspective on the left hand of this. Yeah. Her titch. It, it, the it pulls, the it door is so much right smaller in. than the people. That's correct. It pulls you right <laughs> in. So that's what the feast is about. It's a uh, it's a prelude in a certain sense. It's almost like you know uh, at an opera there's uh, there's music before the action starts, even while the curtain is closed. Uh, there's a prelude. Um, it's supposed to give you a sense of what's coming up, but in sound, not so much in sight. Um, you know, Mozart loved to do preludes like that to his operas, like the Magic Flute and and the others, Figaro and so on. Uh, this is a kind of a prelude too. And some of, again, the church writers in the past have said that if you look at this, this brief incident, you find uh, kind of uh, almost everything that's going to happen later on. Somebody says yes to God. I don't understand what's happening, but I'm going to play my part in it and hopefully things will work out. True for Mary, also true for her spouse, Joseph. Um, also, the idea that this child is not an ordinary child, meaning uh, this child is going to be the one who turns everything upside down in the world. This is the one who is finally going to bring God and the world that God has made together and to try to make God's plan for the world come to fruition. Now, you and I may say, and this is going to be my last comment, look at, look at us today in 2022, right? We have, you know, a, a, a madman invading another country, destroying, killing people, even children. I mean, where has our faith gone? Where has God gone? And yet we know that before us, before our time even, there was the first great world war and the second world war, and then Korea and then Vietnam and so forth. And so this is the story that seems to have no end that constantly human beings wreck and destroy everything that's possible. I mean, when you stop and think about how much money is spent on defense and weapons, what if we were to take that money and spend it on education, on, on research in medicine, uh, even more so than we do? So in a sense, our faith doesn't abandon us. God doesn't abandon us, but continually challenges us to say, um, why are we not doing what we could be doing? Why are we not doing what we should be doing? Um, and I think in a, in a sense, the fact that the Annunciation always, fall, always falls during Lent, it always falls during Lent, is an added thing. I didn't mention that before. It's, a, it's obvious, but we sort of don't even pay attention to it. It makes us ask the question, well, in Lent, I'm supposed to be looking at the basics and trying to understand what it is to believe in God, what it is to try to follow God. Um, the Annunciation makes us ask that question in a very pointed way too. 
By the way, welcome, George Abrams. I see your name. Uh, I see that you must be there somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm up at the Paleo Lab, Michael, and the time got away from me, and so I decided to try something I've never done before. So I'm on my uh, P on my PDA. Okay, great. So it's working. Happy, happy Paleo to you. Okay. Well, let's happy see anybody have anything to say. Shirley, you you've already asked about some of the images. Um, Patrick, do you have anything? George, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, and, and, and you made the point earlier, and it makes sense that this is exactly nine months before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, but the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is about 17 days before Christmas. Correct. Um, yeah. why, why didn't they put them closer together on the calendar? And and how did that come up? How did that come about that you get um, the feast of the Annunciation uh, corresponding to an actual normal pregnancy period, and mm -hmm. the feast of the Immaculate Conception being a very shortened pregnancy of seventeen days? Well, believe it or not, once again, it's it's all mathematics because December the eighth is believed to be the day on which Mary was conceived by her parents, Joachim and Anna. Right? Now, you say, well, th that, is that, that would not be an accurate conception. conception. Right, that's <laughs> right. But that's, that is the day. And in the Eastern Church, they, that's what they say, that there's two things going on. First, the birth of this woman, who will become the mother of the Messiah, the mother of Christ, the mother of Jesus, mother of God. Um, and then because in the 19th century, uh, Pope Pius IX uh, felt that somehow we needed to remind people of how important God's intervening in time and space and history was, he decided to institute the feast of Mary's, uh, not just her conception, but the fact that as a virgin, she was able to conceive and have a son, a miracle. Uh, and this was a reminder to the then modern world, which is well over 150 years ago, because it was 1854 in which he said this. Some of you may, rem re may remember that right around the time this happened, uh, the Virgin Mary appeared in France at Lourdes to a young girl, uh, a shepherd girl, you know, and said to her, I am the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> the girl had to go to the village priest and say, the lady told me that she either was or had the Immaculate Conception. What is that? <laughs> because I mean, a 12 year old girl, if you, said, if you said to her, what is transubstantiation? What is the uh, incarnation? What is the Immaculate Conception? Of course you wouldn't know what it was. Um, and so, of course, people said, aha, that proves that the Pope of that time was right in instituting the feast. Whether he was or not, I don't know. But the interesting thing is, is that the date that was picked um, was not the date that she was born, but it's exactly nine months before the date that Mary was born, which is September the 8th. And that's on our calendar, by the way, uh, uh, even in the Anglican Church. You know, sadly, we don't celebrate often enough the weekday feasts. This one, we're not going to celebrate at all. It happens because of Lent. Uh, but I know a couple of years ago, we, we tried to start doing that, at least for a couple of these, like the Ascension, for example. That's a pretty important one. And it always falls on a Thursday because it's exactly 40 days from Easter Sunday. But... I know that what George and I and Laura did for a couple of years before the pandemic is that we transferred it then to the closest Sunday, which is what some churches do. So that, you know, people are in church and then they can at least hear the gospel for that day and celebrate the feast. So maybe next year, who knows? Maybe next year we'll, we'll say, well, that nearest Sunday to it in Lent, we'll celebrate that as um, the Annunciation or as they used to call it in England, uh, Lady Day, Lady Day, the day of the, the late Our Lady, yeah. 
Now, to be irreverent, has anybody ever heard um, Robin Williams' comedy bid on uh, the conversation that Joseph had to have with Mary after he found out she was pregnant? I don't remember that one. I don't remember that one either. I'll, I'll find it on YouTube, but it's rather hilarious and along the lines that you might. It expect sounds like the, it sounds like George Carlin. Uh, yeah. but I was, it was Rob. It was Robin Williams, and it was okay. Like, it better be immaculate. <laughs> yeah, because because George Carlin, having been raised as a Catholic, uh, had some very funny uh, comedy bits uh, about about it. In fact, I think he even appeared in one of those films with the two guys who worked in the in the takeout store, uh, and he appeared as a cardinal. You know, or a bishop. <laughs> George Carlin has a hilarious bit about crossing the international date line if you haven't had if you haven't received communion on a holy day of obligation. But then you cross the international date line and you're good again. <laughs> you're good again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he also had a funny thing about back when you couldn't eat meat on Fridays during Lent, right? Uh, the old Catholic right. practice, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, he asked the still question, followed said, by many. Yes. Well, he I think he asked the question. He said, I wonder how many people are going to go to purgatory because of a hot dog or a beef jerky. <laughs> Meaning, of course, of course, you know, there's something silly about that, you know. Yeah. You know. But I know that he in an interview once he said, you know, I make a lot of jokes about religion. He said, it's not that I disrespect religion, but he said, there's so many things that people do and say in the practice of their religion that make no sense when you think of what they say they actually believe. And I mean, he went on to say, look at how many people are killed uh, because you're not my religion, you're the wrong religion, you know? Uh, so there's something to be said about that, yeah. And, and there is the survey that you sent me a link to either earlier this week or last week that apparently was commissioned by the Episcopal Church. Yes, um, yes, yeah. That, that the, the basic finding, and it goes into a lot more detail, but the basic finding is that um, religious people think they're a lot more religious than non-religious people think right. that they are. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, Sometimes people think that you should never mention anything political in church. Well, I think that's, a, that's impossible because then you'd have to stop reading the Gospels. I remember one You've time- You've been reading our survey results. Yeah, well, I, I remember one time a, a former member of St. Barnabas said to me, I don't like the fact that politics are being mentioned in church. And I said, now, I know that you're referring to the sermon, but have you listened to the readings? And he kind of just <laughs> shut up. I said, because I can give you a whole bunch of examples of where not only Jesus, but some of the prophets and even St. Paul clearly tell us if we love God and we're trying to do what God wants, uh, we can't allow other things to happen. We have to speak up against them, do whatever we can, you know. Um, no. And that always used to be the thing with uh, assisting those who are in need. Oh, well, they're in need because of their own laziness or their own sloppiness, you know. I mean, like, for example, blame the people at Santiago Estates for the conditions under which the owners have some of them live. Like one of the notorious things is these so-called fixed up trailers, which are uninhabitable, you know. Yeah. And if and somebody needs a place to live with a child, I remember we had a case, you have to have a roof over your head, but there's no heat, there's no electricity, there's no water. And you say, how can you do this? And yet then charge you rent for living in this, you know, thing with four walls, but nothing in it. I mean, what's going on? Isn't there something wrong about that? And the answer is, it sure is. It's illegal to do that. But who's going to prosecute in a non-incorporated town, there's no way to get prosecution of that to happen, you know? Now I hear they're all upset because some windows are broken at the mall. 
police, they caught the guy supposedly. And I don't know what the story is, whether he was high or, or what, you know, uh, but all of a sudden, you know, the saying, oh, we're gonna have a crime wave. We have to put up, you know, bars on all the windows. Hello, uh, we're, not, we're not downtown in the city, you know, somebody went off and, and this could happen anywhere and, you know. But this town needs 24 seven police protection. That's, that's, another, that's another issue. Yeah, I completely agree. We do, we need 24 seven medical care and we need 24 seven. Exactly, and people need to be ready to pay taxes for it. That's right, that's right. You don't get something for nothing. <laughs> Contrary to what people think. Speaking of getting political. <laughs> yeah, speaking of We getting need political. some getting political in Borrego Springs. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, only by pestering the county supervisors did we get the vaccines here, right? It took pestering, right? right? Uh, the COVID task force did that. And I think that's the only way that we're ever going to get some of these things accomplished, you know, by making noise. Now, the day after tomorrow, we're starting our first meeting of a steering committee to get the uh, fire protection district more money. That's right. That's right. That's another thing. I saw that. Yes, that's that's really good. We'll see. Well, I'll tell you what, I have two prayers here. I have one prayer that I've used the church uh, for Ukraine. And then I have the prayer for the day for Annunciation. And I thought we could end with that. Sounds let, good. let us pray. Pour your grace into our hearts, O Lord, that we who have known the incarnation of your son, Jesus Christ, announced by the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary, may by his cross and passion be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Lord, you are the God of peace and justice. We pray now for the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for children at risk and in fear that you would hold and protect them. We ask all of this through your son, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.